Welcome, 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 beautiful people. Welcome to Colorism Conversations. I am Dr. Karen Moore, founder of I Am The Color of Beautiful Global Spoken Word Initiative and Movement. We are redefining the standard of color, standard of beauty for women of color, and our focus is on eradicating colorism in communities of color across the globe. And we are so glad to be back with our show on Sunday evenings at six. And we're glad for a couple of reasons. Glad because it means that my husband is better, much better, and continuing on that road to recovery. And because I just missed it so much and I'm so glad to be back with our colorism conversations. So what we're gonna be doing for these next few weeks for up until the end of the new year is rebroadcasting, having live conversations with some rebroadcasts of previous shows. And I'm really excited about this because we get to extend some of those conversations that got to be really good. And we, and, you know, we had to end the show at that particular time. So I'm really looking forward to being able to rebroadcast these shows and have some additional conversation on some of those topics around colorism. And I'm so, so glad to have joining me, Miss Renee Moore. Hi, Lauren. How are you? Thank you for joining us. I'm so glad to have my sister Renee Moore with me tonight to talk about this deconstructing colorism and loving the skin you're in. So I'm going to bring her on so that you can meet her. Renee Moore. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you so much for being here. And I'm really looking forward to us having this conversation tonight. So Talk to me a little bit, just for a moment, about um, what you know about colorism. And I know that you you are, my sister Renee Moore is our public health advisor for The Color of Beautiful. So if you could kind of give us just a little bit of colorism and it being a public health issue. Right, so colorism can be interracial, which means it's within our own race, or interracial, which means we experience it from other people. And one of the things that I, I don't think that people realize about colorism is that it exists whether you recognize it or not. Um, and sometimes it affects you whether you recognize it or not. Mm -hmm. um, it has a lot to do with um, who's selected for jobs, who gets married, who um, gets asked to the dance. So, um, and all those things affect your, your mental health, which has an impact on your physical health. It also affects your economic status. If you're not able to be the one to get promoted or the one to get the higher paying job because your skin is too dark, mm. then, you know, that impacts your ability to make money, which impacts your ability to have access to health care, which, which impacts your ability to take care of yourself. So it's a tough topic. A lot of people don't want to talk about it. I think it's tough as an interracial topic because we don't like to see ourselves as being divisive. Right. Um, and a lot of it is just things that sometimes we don't even think about because it's things that we've been grown up with. Little comments that were said, you know, from our parents or our grandparents that we just adopted as our own idea and don't realize how hurtful it can be. Yes. So, yeah. And inter interracially, it's difficult because everybody wants to talk about racism in general, but within that racism is colorism. Right, right. Wow. That's so profound that, you know, when you say it, talking about not wanting to really acknowledge it and talk about it. So the show that we're going to show today is a rebroadcast of a show I did, Deconstructing Colorism, Love the Skin You're In with Chika Okora. And it was very interesting because Chika did a TED Talk that had over a million views. And, and he talked about um, the casting call for Straight Out Compton. So listen to it, it's very interesting. And then Renee and I will be back to have some discussion on this particular show. So we will be right back with you. This is a rebroadcast of Deconstructing Colorism with Chika Okora.
So that is colorism, interracial colorism, as well as interracial colorism. And we're going to be talking about some of that today because today we are deconstructing colorism and we're talking about how to love the skin that you're in. So let me tell you about our guest today. Chika Okora is a speaker, woman of color champion, and self-love advocate. Passionate about race and gender issues, she's excited to help women of color develop their inner confidence and combat the negative messages that society often throws at them. Chika earned her undergraduate degree at Harvard University, where she wrote her honors thesis on Black identity in America. She earned her master's degree at Stanford University, where she gave her TEDx talk, Confessions of a D-Girl, Colorism and Global Standards of Beauty, confronting the damaging effects that colorism has on women and girls. That talk has been viewed over one million times all over the world. Chica has since been featured on BET, The Stew Podcast, and Red Table Talk, where she tapped Tackles, let me try it again, where she tackles topics such as self love, self worth, and imposter syndrome, and shares how others can also conquer these obstacles in their lives. So, we want to welcome two beautiful color conversations the beautiful Chika Okoro. Welcome, my sister. Hi, thank you for having me. Thank you so much. Thank you so, so much for being here. here. We're so excited to be able to talk to you today about colorism and about your experiences with colorism. So I want to start off by you kind of explaining about your, t- your TED Talk and letting us know how that came about and about the actual straight out of Compton casting call. If you could kind of give us some background on that. Yes. So it came about almost accidentally in a way. So in my grad program, we had a public speaking course and I enjoy, I've always enjoyed public speaking. And um, in that course, you can talk about anything you wanted. And I've always been interested in race and identity. I studied that in college. And so I knew that I wanted to give my talk around something surrounding race. And so the summer before that class was supposed to begin, I was thinking about what I wanted to talk about. Coincidentally, that was also the summer that Straight Out of Compton came out. And I truly did love that movie. I truly did see it in theaters three times because I'm from outside of LA. So I loved how that movie was, you know, telling the stories of Black people in LA. It was a majority Black cast. And I personally felt very seen and empowered through that movie. And so you can just imagine just how devastating it is or it was when i heard the casting call scandal i, I saw it on facebook it was you know, a scandal look at this discriminatory casting call and it was so just disheartening and just that juxtaposition how before i felt very seen and um you know value through the movie but then to see this casting call and realize that like oh not all black people are as valued. Um, and so I'll do just a quick summary of what that casting call said. Um, it ranked the women from the women extras that are in the movie from A to D, A being the most desirable and the A girls were described as the hottest of the hot models, um, you know, listed all these ethnicities, did not list black. And then it goes down to the B girls and the B girls, the mm-hmm. prototype was Beyonce, with everyone who's like, how is Beyonce a B-girl? And <laughs> right. um, the B-girl was said, you have to have light skin, long, real hair, super thin, uh, you know, model type. And the C-girls could have been medium skin tone. Um, it's okay if you're wearing a weave, but your hair still needs to be long. And then the D-girls with the darker skin, poor and out of shape. And so just to see how just literally written in black and white, a clear value judgment, you know, based on hair type and skin tone. And it was just so disheartening that this movie that I first thought I thought was empowering to really see what was going on behind the scenes. And just with how deeply I felt that betrayal, I'm like, that is what I want to give my talk about. And so I you know, developed this talk um, in, in 
for the class and the professor is a TED speaker. And so he invited me to reprise that talk for the conference. Wow, that's amazing. And it was, it was, it was an amazing, amazing talk. And I want to advise anyone that's watching us to go to YouTube and to watch that talk. It was, it was absolutely, absolutely amazing. And you also in that talk talked about even about seeing how young girls, how children are being conditioned to think that the lighter your skin when they did the, the study with who's the Dollar pretty time. girl when they had the little girl there and who's the pretty girl and she picked the white girl and who's the smart girl and she picked the white girl and who's the ugly girl she picked the dark skinned black girl. Yeah. And so it is, it is so important that we understand what's happening in our communities and that we are focused on making sure that our girls who are coming up understand their importance and their value and that we continue to really impress that upon them. So that, that talk was amazing. And not only would I recommend that our audience go see that talk, but also have your girls, your young girls watch that talk because um, Chica was really amazing with it. And you'll have the opportunity to be able to have your girls exposed to what's happening, but to know that there, there is a young, beautiful black woman out here telling them that they are beautiful. So that TED Talk was done in 2016. Mm -hmm. um, do you see a change in what's happening with colorism since that time? Yeah, you know, there there definitely has been some changes, I would say, in, in representation in two ways. Um, I have been seeing more, <clears throat> more representation in the media. Uh, one show that I point to that I love is Insecure, where the okay. two main characters are brown skinned women. Right. Rarely do you see that. Usually the main character is much lighter skin. It might have her, you know, darker skin friends, you know, her brown skin sidekick, but here, for those of us insecure, you know, Molly and Issa, both dark skin. Um, rarely do you see that, right? So right. that's definitely progress. Um, If, you know, I go on the shelves and products for me don't exist, that invalidates your lived experience. So I am, I am starting to see that, you know, we're seeing products for us. Uh, we're seeing products for, you know, all hair textures, not just the loose curls, you know, you're seeing products right, for right. all textures. So I, so I am starting to see improvements. Um, and I, I, I hope it, I hope it can be sustained. Yes, that was the next question is, do you think the change will last? You know, I, I hope so. I really hope so. Um, you know, I do think that, I think there definitely has been some true step function changes. Like, I, I think the beauty industry is forever changed. Like, right. no beauty companies can now get away with not having uh, products that, that truly fit the needs of everybody. Um, I'm hoping that we can see a sustained change in media. It's weird because it, it comes in, in waves. So right now, I feel like we're experiencing what, what feels like this like renaissance of, of black people in, me in media. And, um, I hope, I hope it, it stays. Um, I'm optimistic right. when I see, um, things like, um, the young daughter from from Blackish, how she was like the youngest executive producer. Yes. Um, and so as so as she gets older, you know, she will be creating content. And I know Issa is trying to open lots of doors for you know other black content creators. So I'm hoping that that will help. You know, things change in the future because it's you know it's, it's when people like us are making the content. Right. That's how you'll see the representation. Right. So I'm, I'm practically optimistic. <laughs> yes. Yes. And we have to have optimism. We have to be hopeful. Mm -hmm. um, did you ex have any experiences with colorism as a child or as a teenager? 
Can you give us some some background on on any experiences you may have had when you were when you were younger? Yeah, so it's, it's interesting because I definitely always felt it was something, but I didn't know what the name of it was. Right. So, um, you know, yeah, I remember in in high school, but I grew up in a community that there was not that many black families. You know, I was definitely one of the few. You know, me and my my friends we were you know, one of the very few, mm-hmm. and you know, I remember not getting a lot of attention, you know, not getting a lot of attention from the guys. I had always thought, like, oh, well, it's because I'm black. So once I could put myself in, you know, more black settings, then maybe I'll have more luck. You know, when you're young, that's on everyone, you know, more right. things like everybody else. And then so when I'll get into more majority black spaces, still feeling invisible, still feeling overlooked. And I remember like, not knowing why, I'm like, oh, my braids not cute enough. Like, it's a, it's a hot dress that I, I remember there was one particular um, moment that was almost like the watershed moment. It was me, a friend of mine who's also brown skin, same complexion as me, and our friend, she's half Mexican, half Mexican, half black, because he's mixed. So, okay. you know, had the light skin, light eyes, these curls. Right. And three of us were walking, we're walking through the mall for the pure focus of just trying to get attention. And, uh, you know, we're like 14 or something. And mm-hmm. all the guys are making a beeline to my friend that's Smith. Beeline. All the guys are coming straight to her. And my friend, who's brown skin like me, is getting more and more upset. So by the end of the, the afternoon, she's like, ah, it's not fair. You know, everyone's just talking to her because she's light skin. And that was like a light bulb went off of like, oh, that's what's been going on. And it's like, once you see something, you can't unsee it. And wow. so now, as I'm in different situations, I'm like, wow, like, yeah, like, you know, everyone's always going to the girl that looks mixed or the girl who looks feral. And I'm like, me and the other brown skin girls are kind of, you know, trying our best to get people's attention, but there's definitely a feeling of being invisible. And so I definitely felt it, I just never knew what it was. And it actually wasn't until I got to college and I took a lot of race, you know, African American studies okay. and, critical race theory that I learned like, oh, there's a name to it. It's called colorism. This is the history. And it's like, oh, that's what it was I had been experiencing all this time. Right, right. Now you went to two very prestigious universities. Mm-hmm. Um, did you feel like you experienced colorism on the university level with these two prestigious universities? And and talk to us about how that may have been with your fellow black students as well as your fellow white students right so I definitely I feel like I felt it more in college because like I said in my grade school through high school there wasn't that many black people right to really see the distinctions I think it was just we were black which means we weren't part of the majority so then when I got to Harvard where there was a lot more of us that there was a pretty robust black community but a robust enough that you can see the vision. You can see oh, the wow. vision. Okay. And um, yeah, like it's, it's very clear who are, you know, who are the ones that are sought after. It's very clear who are the, um, the ones who are popular. You know, it's, it's, it's really right, clear. Right. And then also, while we didn't really have strong fraternities and sororities, we did have um, other types of social clubs. And once again, you know, when you look, it's like, oh, wow, they all look a certain way. Um, So, yeah, so definitely saw it playing out. I mean, it wasn't as overt as like, you know, in what you see in the movie School Days. It wasn't as like, there's no overt brown paper bag has, but the legacies of it are still there. Especially, you know, you'll talk, I'll talk to students um, or, you know, my classmates. And they're in things like Jack and Jill, and they're talking about how, you know, their parents were in different clubs, and it's like, you know, you see the ones who, you know, um, come from a legacy of, of, of privilege and things like that, and it's, it's those that are, that are lighter skin, and it's because it's, it's generational. So mm-hmm. definitely saw it, saw it playing out there. Right. Do you see it so much in, your, in the work that you do? In the work that I do, what, what do you mean? So I mean in your job. 
I mean, your job, I'm mm. sorry. I, I, on, on the job, do you see, yeah. do you feel like you've experienced it on the job? Yeah, no, great question. No, because I work in, in marketing at an e-commerce company. And throughout my years being there, I think they've gotten much more conscious and much more aware and have now I feel like really been a part of the diversity and inclusion conversation. Um, and then, you know, they're definitely trying to learn. When I first got there and they're much smaller, there was definitely an assumption of the types of models that they casted. And when they did cast a black model, um, you know, it wasn't someone with braids. It wasn't necessarily someone that was you know, very brown skin. They've come a long, a long way okay. since, I, since I've been there. When I started, they were, they were smaller. But um, it's just that there, there's definitely this preconceived notion. Like, I remember there was a conversation. They're looking at a model. And they're like, yeah, but what are we going to do about her hair? She has braids. I'm like, what is wrong with braids? Right. You know, and so right. we no longer have those conversations anymore. But it just shows that, you know, there is this preconceived notion of, you know, what is on brand and, you know, what what would look appealing. And so, um, and it, and I think it's it's a subconscious notion. That it's not until you raise someone's consciousness of like, well, why is that? I didn't think about that. So it's just a testament that a lot of these um, beliefs are subconscious. And so I'm hoping that with combos like this, it can bring it to the consciousness so we can then up uproot it and unlearn it. Right. So are you pretty much free to give your input? When they have these these kinds of things come up, are do you feel free to be able to give your input on it and find out why particular things are happening or not happening? Yes. Yeah. So definitely, they've been very open and want to learn. And so, to the extent that I'll see things I don't agree with, typically open to having a conversation. That way, we can get to to a much better place. Right. That that's that's great. Mm -hmm. um, why do you think colorism seems to be an issue that people do not want to talk about? That is a great question. It's definitely something that I've noticed within, you know, just as I've learned about it and as I um, try to engage in conversation. I think it's, you know, as a black community, and I do believe this is that, you know, we, we are stronger together and to acknowledge colorism means for us to acknowledge the the discrimination within our own community and it's like it's almost uh, like you don't want to air your dirty laundry like i don't think we we want to admit that even within ourselves that there are these beliefs and it's a belief in which you know those with proximity to whiteness is advantageous like no one in the black community wants to admit that right you know right. but um but we know it exists and so by not talking about it is what lets it continue. So, I, you know, it's, I think it's, it's us ourselves just not wanting to come to terms with the, the internalized racism that is seeped deep within the community. Right. That, that is so true. And I think that we, we don't, we don't, not only do we not want to acknowledge it, but Having a conversation seems to be a very difficult thing in regard to colorism. People kind of just don't, they don't really want to even, like you said, acknowledge that it exists. And, and they don't, especially don't want to engage in conversation about it. And that's one of the things that I know I have found is that it's difficult to get people to engage in a conversation about it. And until we're able to have conversations and be able to get to our healing, we're going to continue, in my opinion, we're going to continue to experience it and not be able to really address it. Yet we've got women who are dealing with decades of hurt, as well as our young girls that are coming up and now having to deal with it. And it is, it, it, it's, it's, it's there and it's visible, but we just push it under the rug. And I think that we really need to get to the place where we're really acknowledging that it exists and that we have to have open conversations 
so that we can heal. Yes, yes. No, it's having that open conversation because, like you said, that is how the healing happens. Because right now, it's you know, like you said, this is generational. It's being passed down. And actually, I was on a a webinar conversation uh, either early this week or last or last week, and we had um, an older woman on the on the call, and she was talking about how she doesn't. Uh, she doesn't experience it when she was growing up, but she was like, you know, but when I, when I think of how things are today, I think it's much better. And, you know, the rest of us on the call are like, oh, it's definitely still an issue. And it's, it's one of those things where it's like, I, you know, I wish it were better, you know, and I, I think for her, it, it is very disheartening that, you know, what she experienced, you know, in the 40s, 50s, um, is still half, you know, is, I know it's not as overt. It may not be as overt. You know, she, she just you know, had very vivid memories of just very brazen, um, disrespect. While it's not as overt, the hurt is still there. And that's even yes. what I learned when I gave my talk and the outpouring of school age children that reached out to me saying, I relate, I relate. And it's like, while I'm glad that my talk is an inspiration, my heart breaks that you still feel this way. You know, mm-hmm. that, that at 13, 14, and, and that's what really made me very passionate about wanting to talk about this because it exists. Even yeah. though we're not acknowledging it, you know, brown skin girls all over the world will tell you that they don't, that they are made to feel lesser than. And that is, is, dev- is going to be devastating to, you know, your development of your self-perception and of your own, you know, self-esteem and self-confidence. And, you know, self-confidence is what you need to propel you through the world. And yeah. so if that is stunted at a young age, then, you know, we can't reach our full potential. Absolutely. Absolutely. So how do you think we can effectively work towards eradicating colorism in our communities? We did talk about open conversations and things like that. Do you think there's anything else that we need to be doing or that we can do to help to address the issue? Yes. Um, open conversation. And cause what that does is it, it brings them to our consciousness. Because, you know, so much comments are made that's really just the subconscious of like, Oh, are her light eyes so pretty? Or like, you know, you know, look, look at her hair. Like all these little things, young people soak it up. And so, and while people aren't aren't meaning harm by it, people notice, especially those that are in families where, uh, you know, your siblings are all an, an array of colors. It's yes. you can pick up on how different folks are being treated. And so, bring it to your consciousness to make sure that you truly are expressing that everyone has value. So making sure they're expressing that at an early age. And also, you know, really watching what people are exposed to. You know, when I think back to that, the doll test of the four-year-old or five-year-old girl and how um, she so quickly is able, or in her mind, is able to label the the white doll as pretty and smart. And, you know, and the darker skin doll as the opposite, that is learned. Like that is not an innate belief that we have. And so how can we make sure that we're exposing, you know, young people to examples that look like them? Because I do think it's very harmful if you feel like the representation of yourself is, is deemed as lesser than. I think that's very harmful. So making sure that we are exposing young people yeah. to examples of like them that they can um that's in a good light to show that like hey this person looks like me and they're beautiful they're smart they're valued right. Um, right. and so just you know having more leaders um even i think a lot of it begins in school not many of us had black teachers you know where we often have yeah. white teachers um so even you know, it's more, you know, more people in our community can be teachers and if we can, you know, put our kids in schools where they can see people in power, people in an authority that look like them, I think will have a really big effect. Absolutely. I think that is so true. And I think that 
even in the media too, we have to begin to see differences with, like you were saying about television and in the movies and things like that. You know, we, we've got to begin to see ourselves in the movies. Our young girls have to begin to see the beautiful. I know one of the things that, that always struck me, Viola Davis saying, you know, why can't I be the love interest? Why can't I be, you know, the woman that is pursued as, as attractive and beautiful? And it's going to be really important for us to even begin to see ourselves in the media as, and like you said, because I, um, I loved, um, I haven't seen Insecure. I don't watch Insecure, which I, I'm going to check it out. But even seeing Issa Rae in the photograph, that movie, it was just, it was just wonderful to see yeah. A beautiful black woman being pursued mm -hmm. as a love interest and as a beautiful black woman, and yeah. I think so much that we really need to see so much more of that, and our girls need to be able to see so much more of the fact that yes, we are beautiful and will be acknowledged by our men as being beautiful. Mm -hmm. So, um. What would you say to your eight-year-old self or to an eight-year-old girl about their dark skin? What yes. would you say to a 16-year-old? And then what would you say to a 21-year-old? Yeah. To the eight-year-old, I will tell her, uh, I will tell myself, um, that you are beautiful and that you are, you are as beautiful as you are smart and as you are creative. And as you are a leader, um, and to to never forget that you have so much to offer. Yes. That's on my eight-year-old yes. or an eight-year-old. Uh, to the sixteen-year-old, um, I will tell her to to not worry at all about what the boys are doing, what the boys are thinking. And to and to know that you know right now is the time to develop yourself, and right now is the time yes. to you know try to start to figure out what your passions are. And you know this, you know, sixteen, you know, some of your your best years. So have fun, have fun with your friends. Have fun starting to learn the things that you're good at and start to learn the things that you're passionate about. And the right guy will come. So do not waste, don't pay them any mind. Especially <laughs> at this age, they're, they're yes. silly. You are beautiful. You are smart. Like, this is the beginning of the journey. Yeah. And to the 21 year old, I would tell her, you know, this is your time. The world is your oyster. Um, don't, you know, don't look for the world to validate you. So the world was never meant, was never built to validate us. That's true. So instead, you know, this is the time to, for you to validate yourself. And when you do that, and when you love yourself so much that it's overflowing, then the right person will come and scoop up what's overflowing. Yeah. So I think, you know, at 21, we're, we're double colored, we're out into the world, and I feel like we're like, world, accept me. You know, not like when you think of the history of the US, right. <laughs> the world is never built to accept us. So, right. um, you know, 21 is that, you know, I wish that at that time I had the knowledge that everything I needed was within me and all the love that I was seeking from outside, I had that within me. And, you know, it's only when you love yourself so much that you then can look, can be able to receive the, the love from, receive true and unselfish and pure love from, from someone else. Right. That is so true. And I think that that's, that's such great, great, great advice. And for our young people to be able to really tap into that. I know. And when I usually ask that question, it is, 
when you look at it, and I know for myself, because I'm, I'm much older than you are, um, but I know that when I, when I think about how I came up and how I had to address the issues of how I felt about myself, that I think it's so important that we acknowledge all of those different feelings that we have, but that we're able to tap into who we will become. And you saying to the 16 year old, you know, the world is your oyster. I think that is so profound that at 16 girls start to realize that they have so much. And I think there's so much pressure many times put on young girls about boys and whether or not boys like you. And that's really not the important thing when you're, when you're 16, all of that will come it will all come with time. And I think it's also important that you surround yourself with people who really value you. And that you find those people who are going to be in your inner circle that are going to value you for who you are and not for what you look like or anything else. That it's, it's, a, it's a value of who you are as a person and that you work on who you are as a person and you become that beautiful, incredible woman that you're destined to be. So I think that was really profound um, advice that you gave there. So I'm going to ask you. Um, I'm going to ask you. So when you, when you're looking at colorism and you're looking at interracial versus interracial, interracial being among black people themselves and in interracial being outside of our communities. What is your what is your feeling about where we're going to be able to go as far as bridging that gap outside of our communities? We've got to fix it first in our community, I know. But even outside of our community, how do we begin to bridge that gap and begin to have conversations outside of our community? Do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, no that that's a really good that's a really good topic. I will say, you know, when we start to embrace it within our community, then I think we'll, then I think we'd have firmer ground to stand on to chat about it outside of our community. Because right now, you know, for those on the outside looking in, they, they're seeing who, who we value. Right. So I think when, when we are able to embrace all of us within the community. I and mean, when we're able to address our internalized racism and, and root out those feelings, then I think we'll be able to, you know, talk to those outside of our race and and really say, you know, why are you placing value in just those that are that are lighter skin? Like why why are you, you know, placing value in those that who you think have more proximity to you, you know, then, then right. I feel like we, we would really be able to educate and really show them how it's wrong. It's harder to do that um, when we too are, yeah. are, you know, uh, having those beliefs. But, you know, I think as we start to root those out, then we'll be able to, you know, confront those same issues of those that are perpetuating outside of our race. Right, absolutely. Chica, thank you so much for being here and for sharing with us. It's been it's time off. Oh man. <laughs> um, I know, my I, quiz. My quiz, huh? Time went by quick. I know it did. It really went by pretty quick. So what I'd like you to do is to give us um any last comments that you would have and please tell us how we'll be able to reach you to for people to contact you if they want to have i know that you speak and you do some other things in regard to colorism and self-worth and just encourage women empowering women to love themselves so if you could give us just some closing comments and how people can reach you please do that now yeah so closing comments is you know Everything you need is within yourself. I think as a community, we have we are in need of a lot of healing. And it's very hard to control what's going on outside of us. It's very hard for, you know, big X society to change. What we can control is ourselves and our thoughts and our minds. And just know that all the answers, you already have all the answers. And as we, as Black women, really start to love ourselves, root out the negative thoughts, 
and really learn how to validate ourselves, then we'll be able to, to thrive. So I enjoyed this conversation. You all can find me um, on Instagram at Chika Okoro825. That's at C H I K A O K O R O 825. Uh, follow me the content I post, uh, subscribe to my newsletter um, so you can catch some of my blogs where I go into much more detail into a lot of these topics that we've already touched on here. Thank you so much. That was amazing. That was amazing. Thank you for joining us, Kika. I'm going to have a few closing comments, um, but thank you so much for being here, okay? Hold thank on. you for having me. You're welcome. Thank you. All right, that was our rebroadcast of our show with Chica Okoro, and that was an amazing show. She made some really, really, really amazing points and some really interesting things. And one of the things I want to I want to talk about in particular is the in the beginning she talked about the straight out of Compton casting call. Mm -hmm. And the thing that was, was so, now I'm not, I was never an NWA fan. I don't do rap. I don't follow rap. I don't know a whole lot about NWA or straight out of Compton or any of that, but it was just amazing to me about the casting call and how they decided that the D girls, the D girls were the dark skinned girls that were poor and out of shape. That's how they described the casting call for the D girls. Everyone else was medium or light skin, you know, good hair, great bodies. They were the fine, the fine girls, the best of the best. And, you know, the dark skin girls were left to be the D girls. And so, you know, it was interesting because when I did some research on that, the company that did the casting call, of course they apologized and they said they, <laughs> they said that they did not intend to offend anyone. <laughs> Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> maybe it's me and because I'm a dark skinned girl, maybe, you know, but I'm like, how can you possibly think that was not offensive? Well, I go so troubling because you not only f felt that that wasn't offensive enough to put it up in a casting call, mm -hmm. you not only for, for whatever reason felt it wasn't offensive, but you you felt it was really okay to say that that the D girls were the dark skinned girls who were poor and not in good shape. But I think that goes back to that whole idea that some people don't even recognize that they're colored because that's apparently what the way they viewed the world. Eh, yeah. And, and then once again, it was just like I was saying just before she went on, which I didn't even realize she said this until I was listening to it. That just goes to show you how we don't even realize how colorism is affecting us. Because she went and she loved the movie. She thought it was great. She, she, you know, but not realizing that she wouldn't have been in that movie in a positive role. Right. And what effect, if she wants to be an actress or she, you know, that's her goal, she's not even realizing how people's, set perceptions of people based on the color of their skin is affecting her, her ambitions or the ambitions of others. And other people may not even have recognized that. Yeah, that, that's true. And I think that when it comes to, and that was just also a great example of interracial colorism, because that was people on the outside mm -hmm. judging women of color based on this particular ranking. So that was that inter interracial colorism where, you know, it's like, well, this is how we see, this is how we view women of color. And so then what happens is that go that kind of uh, perpetrates the intraracial colorism because people going to watch that movie, especially young children, she's talking about the visions that young children see if I, as a light-skinned girl, go watch that movie and I see all the light-skinned girls as the pretty right. girls, the desirable girls, then, hey, I'm pretty and desirable. You, as a dark-skinned person, goes and you're 
I mean, I don't know what the movie was rated, but as a young person, you're going and you're seeing everybody that looks like you is poor, is fat, is ghetto. Then what does that say about what you feel you can be? Right. Or how people perceive you. Right. You, know, you see on the screen, the people that look like you aren't the, the attractive ones, aren't the ones that are, that people want. Right. So what else did you, did you hear that, um, that really kind of talked to you? Um, I, I, I was interesting how she said that she didn't know what the name of what she was feeling was and how, you know, she didn't feel cute. And she's like, what's almost like, what's wrong with me? And that's a big problem with colorism is that you internalize it. You think this, there's something wrong with me. You don't think there's something wrong with any, everybody else. Right. <laughs> right. So you're right. Like, it's, exactly. gotta, it's gotta be me, which is not healthy to think that there was something wrong with you because what is perceived as being wrong is not something that you can change or you can fix and you shouldn't want to change or fix that. Right. That is so true. And you know, when you talk about, um, when you talk about the, the doll study, the Clark doll study, and the fact that even as, as, as young children, girls are conditioned that mm -hmm. the dark skin is not the pretty girl. It's not the smart girl. So you're being conditioned at such a young age mm -hmm. and having not, like you say, they're, you know, not knowing as we're growing up, not knowing that it's not, it's a conditioning and that it's not, it's not us, but this is the conditioning that has taken place many times within our families as well as within society. Okay. That's true. So, you know, um, so I thought one of the other things that she, she said was really, was really um, important that, that we need to really begin to focus on as women and as, as we're dealing with our young girls and talking to our young girls is about validating ourselves mm. and being able to decide for ourselves. That's one of the things I remember watching an interview with Nikki Giovanni and she's saying, you know, who has a right to tell you what is, what is, what is beautiful? What is that you're, or that you're not, right. who, who, who has the right to tell you that? And so if we're not speaking that to ourselves, and telling ourselves that and validating each other, you know, and, and beginning to have that conversation that I do see you as a beautiful woman. And we as women have to really get to the place where we as black women, women of color, begin to do that with one another to say, you know, to say to another sister, you're beautiful, to say to another sister, you're important. Because many times if we, if you have not gotten to that place where you feel that way about yourself, sometimes someone saying that to you can make all the difference in the world. But, but you know, we have to begin to decide for ourselves what we are going to say is beautiful and not leave that up to anybody else to decide for me what is beautiful. But, but a lot of that starts at home because as a seven-year-old, where are you going to hear that? It should be coming from your mother. It should be coming from your father, your aunts, yeah. your, you know, your teachers. So uh, if you have to be in that type of environment to develop that from a young age. Um, That's true. But I think someone there that says to you, you know, you are beautiful. You are worthy. You are enough, you know? Right, right. And I think that, I, I know that, um, I, I remember when the, the video went viral of the hairdresser that was doing the little girl's hair. Mm -hmm. And she said, she and the little girl said, I'm ugly. And the hairdresser was like, no, you're not. Who told you that? That's right. And you know, she just embraced that little girl who was saying that she was ugly. And I, I you know, whatever might happen within our families, 
we've got to begin to deconstruct all of that within the family. Right. And many times it is, it is a family issue. And, you know, I can, I can honestly say that it was, I never experienced it. I know you don't consider yourself light skin, um, but you are lighter than I am. Um, and I never experienced it in our household. Yeah. It never was an issue within our household. I never felt that I was treated differently than you, though you were the favorite child. Oh, so you, were, but you were the favorite child. We'll discuss that later. Right? <laughs> I never felt like, I never felt it within our home that I was different or that I was treated any different or that I was told that I was not beautiful or anything like that. And I think that uh, it wasn't until I got outside of the home where I began to see the difference in how I was treated based on my color. Now, it is definitely something that has got to begin to be deconstructed within our families and we've got to be able to stand up within our families and say, you know, no, this is not acceptable. No, this is not right. Mm -hmm. And even if we have to tell our grandmothers and our mothers or whoever it may be that, you know, this is not, this is not good. This is not right. That we are all beautiful and we've got to get away from that whole house house Negro, slave Negro thing. We got to get away from all of that and understand the value of all of us and that every person has value. Every person is beautiful. We need to speak this to our young girls and, and not have them growing up to become bitter, broken women. So and I bitter, broken women right. so that we can talk to our girls who don't end up, you know, um, people, a lot of people say, you know, black women are angry and a lot of dark skinned women get the angry black woman label. Mm. Well, you know, I say all the time that, you know, you don't know the story behind the, the woman that may appear to be an angry black woman. She may be a hurt black woman. Mm -hmm. Maybe if you took the time to talk to her and see what was going on with her, it could be that she's a hurt black woman and that she has endured some things throughout her life that have made her not feel valued, not feel important, not feel beautiful. And so here she is. Now she's a woman who's had to endure all of this. And, and like, and like, you know, you said it, there may not be an understanding of exactly what it is that has made her feel this way, especially if she's dark skinned growing up in a family where so many people are lighter than she is. And a lot of times too, it, you know, people don't realize the power of words. And especially when you're dealing with children, a lot of what's said as a joke has an undercurrent to it. Yeah. That children begin to internalize that. All those jokes about, oh, your your mama's so black, she, you know, whatever, or you know, you're so light, whatever. Those things are said, um, you know, supposed to be jokingly or, you know, or whatever, but that the power of those words sticks with people. So we really have to even just cut a lot of that out in our families. Yeah. You know, it's, it's degrading to, to our own people. And it's not, you know, I always say, you know, I never really realized that it, I was offended by it, but I had an uncle that called me Little White Karen. Yeah, he did. I don't think he knew my name. <laughs> I really don't think he knew my name. He called you Little White Karen. <laughs> All he called me was Little White Karen. And, and you know, at, 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 at the age where I was, I wasn't going to say anything to him because we're raised too with that whole thing of you don't talk back to your elders. You don't correct your elders. But, you know, as I grew up, I began to think, you know, I really don't like that name because I'm not Karen and I'm not white. So we do have to be very careful of the things that we, and I don't think he meant harm by it. I think, you know, it was one of those things where, oh, I'll just say this because it's kind of funny. But what kind of impact does that have on a person now and down the line. Right. 
Lauren says, when I told my late father that I wanted to be a supermodel like Beverly Johnson or Iman, my father said, quote, that's like every black boy wanting to be a professional athlete. You should focus on something more practical, something society needs Whoa. you for. Whoa. And you're beautiful, Lauren. You're absolutely beautiful. And you know, it's, it's funny that she should say that because um, one of the things that uh, I think Chica was saying was about having role models. And you know, the media really needs to, and even we ourselves have to be very conscious of pointing out to our children, if this person can do it, you can do it. And be encouraging and supportive. I mean, there's so many, I mean, not only Kamala Harris, but I mean, there's um, a, a, a chef, uh, Chef Russell, that just became a Michelin star. She's the first black woman in the 93 year history of Michelin star chefs to become a Michelin star chef. So mm -hmm. any little black girl that wants to be out there and be a chef, you can be the best, you can be a Michelin star chef. The, the, um, Marissa Martin, the one that did the, the first, she was the youngest producer in history at age 13. Yeah. You know, so it's so important, the power of words and what we tell our children and to be supportive of their ideas. There was the, um, L L Lena Waithe, first black woman to win a, a primetime Emmy for a comedy series. Okay, there's so many things they were out there doing. Recently, there was the first um, black woman that's going to be Jeanette, uh, I can't remember her last name. She's going to be the first black woman on an international space station. Mm -hmm. So we have to believe in our children. We have to tell them, if that's what you want to do, then it, it's going to take some work. It's going to take some discipline. But you can do it. Right. But I think, you know... Um our parents had a certain experience and because our parents had that experience, um, I think that they, in many instances, they want, they feel like they have to, they have to give you what is reality and that you, sometimes I think our parents, now I don't know, I don't know how old Lauren is, but I know, I think our parents were very much because of how they, what they came through and how they came up that it was very much about what realistically you could do. For instance, I remember when Barack Obama came, became president, I knew that for mom, that meant something totally different than what it meant for us. Mm -hmm. Because in her world, I mean, even for me in my world, I never would have imagined that I would have seen a black president in my lifetime. So you can imagine what our 80 some year old mother felt about seeing a black president. Mm. So, you know, many times I think our parents say things based on their experience and what they know to be their experience having come up through the civil rights era, having come up and seen so many things. And I think that many times they want to keep us from disappointment and from hurt, but not realizing that we can rise above some of these things that held them back. And I think for those of us that are, though I found out the other day, they changed the age for baby boomers. I, I didn't quite get it. But anyway, for those of us that typically are considered baby boomers, what we have to do for our children and our grandchildren, because a lot of baby boomers at this point are grandparents, we've got to be able to see beyond what our own experience is and be able to communicate to our children and to our grandchildren about the possibilities and that you can be anything you absolutely want to be. And this is one of the things I said when Barack Obama became president. Now, when you tell a child that you can, you can be anything, even president of the United States, there was a point of reference. So now there's a point of reference, Kamala Harris being vice president. There's a point of reference now for these children to see that, yes, I can be absolutely, I can be president of the United States. I can be vice president of the United States. We now have these points of reference so that it goes beyond what my experience is for my generation 
And so the generation under me and the generation under them now have a point of reference because sometimes unless you are really, really, really tapped in and really in tune and really can see beyond what you see, many times it seems like it's impossible. And, and I and I definitely agree that we definitely need points of reference. Um, and what I would say to that is do the research because the point of reference doesn't have to be the most famous person in the world. That's true. Okay. Cause there are black people that are, are nuclear scientists. There are black people that are physicists. There are black people who are doctors, lawyers, engineers. We're out there doing everything that there is to be done. So if your child comes to you and tells you, I want to be a geologist, then you can best believe that somewhere out there is a black geologist. And right now with the, the internet, I mean, it may, like you say, with the baby, with art, when we were growing up, it might have not been as easily accessible to find that information, but now we can. So say, so you know what, you want to be a geologist, this person is a geologist too, you can do it just like them. But I think too- not, not only that, but sometimes I, even on the journey to be that, you may not be exactly that. I'll never forget, I, I can't remember her name, Tracy Lynn, I think it was. So her mother always said, you're going to be a doctor. You're going to be a doctor. You're going to be a doctor. And in her mind, that meant a medical doctor. And she couldn't stand the sight of blood. So that wasn't going to work out well. But guess what? She got her PhD and now she's a doctor. Because mm -hmm. it wasn't necessarily in the form that, that I don't know, her mother was thinking or she was thinking. But it still happened. And I think also that we can encourage our children that even if you become the first, That's that it. still is an option because we're still in the year 2020, we're still getting the first black this and the first black that and the first black. Well, if there isn't anybody yet, then you're going to be the first. There you go. And that's what we need to really be communicating to our children is that if that's what you want and that's who you want to be, you're going to be the first. That's it. Let me first. Yeah, and, and, you know, don't worry about, uh, because one of the things interesting that, that Chica was talking about was the corporate look and a corporate brand. And, you know, we can sometimes be intimidated by that. We go in, because I know I, one time <laughs> I went to apply for a job and I looked at the office and it, all white people. And I thought to myself, this is not where I belong. And I went through the motions of filling out the paperwork, but I had no intention of ever going back to the interview because I just felt like there's nobody here that looks like me. Mm. What I should have said is, I'm going to be the first one here that looks like me. And then I'm going to open the door for the next one to make it a little bit easier for them. So sometimes we have to be willing to take that, that risk, that challenge, that, you know, and be the like you say, be the one to break the barrier. Be the first. Absolutely, absolutely. And sometimes, even though someone might, we might not see people that look like us, because we could go into the whole hair discussion. We could spend hours talking about black women in hair. <laughs> uh, we really could. But um, you know, it's it's. Um, I think we have to make sure that we're not letting anything stop us from being originally who we are. I think that there still are some, some, some issues regarding hair and what is considered acceptable in certain spaces with our hair. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm not sure exactly how we're going to deal with the, um, the hair thing, but, um, I think that we nonetheless should go forth being authentically who we are. Mm -hmm. And, you know, cause I remember when, you know, when we were coming up, you didn't dare go on an interview with, with braids. That's right. I mean, they, they, we, we went through training about what to do in an interview and you did not wear braids. You did not wear your hair natural. You did not wear braids. You know, um, no piercings, no tattoos. No, I mean, they didn't do tattoos too much back when we were in the in the interviewing space. But um, you know, there's there's a whole lot of different things now that are 
that can be that can be difficult to get past certain certain barriers though you know sometimes too you have to be you know it, it, sometimes you might have to just start your own yeah if you're a unique kind of individual and you want the funky hair <laughs> You want the funky hair and you want to be able to do the piercings and the tattoos and all the rest of that. You may have to start your own and yeah. just be that person that says, okay, I'm, you know, this, I'm starting my own business. I'm going to do, I'm going to do what's authentic and naturally me. And I think there are spaces where you can, where you can go, um, in what's considered the unconventional corporate America. I know, um, when I worked for Apple, you know, when you look at Apple, I don't think even Mark Zuckerberg. I don't think he 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 had put a suit on until he went before Congress. You know, mm -hmm. jeans and you know, and and Tim Cook the same way. It's jeans and a shirt, and you know, let's let's get it moving. But um, I think that we have to be willing to try and to be the first in in all kinds of spaces, even if it means that it's unconventional. But we're going to be the first to take this step to be different. So I, I do want to mention that um, Lauren says she was 12 when the incident with her father happened. She's 49, but adulthood is where we spend the rest of our lives, repeating habits and actively recovering from the hang up of our childhood. And, and to that, I would say, you know, it's, it's a healing process and we need to, to do what we need to do to heal, whether that's seeking professional help or just stepping out and, and starting to really believe in yourself, to speak positivity to yourself. And you're never too old to, to re, to redo yourself, mm -hmm. to get, to gain that confidence. The community is important. The people you surround yourself with, very important. And sometimes, um, even though we don't always want to, to look at it or admit it, sometimes it may even mean spending less time with family. If, if, if your family environment is toxic and your family does not really love you and appreciate you for who you are. Well, you know, some, of too, some of it too. I, I, I'm, always a big, I'm, a, I'm a big believer too in giving people a chance. So if I come to you and I say, you know what? I know this has been going on for 40 years, but I think we need to talk about it because I find it hurtful. I find it mm -hmm. unacceptable. And if we can sit down and talk about it and I can explain to you why it makes me feel the way I feel and you can respect that and you can agree that that type of behavior needs to be stopped, then great, we can continue and we can go from there and, and point out when those people are due because sometimes habits are hard to break. So if I'm saying something that I'm, I've been saying for 50 years, when I say it, if I'm really truly love you and I'm really truly trying to change and I'm really try truly trying to help you heal, then I want you to point it out to me when I make those mistakes, when I say those things that are hurtful. Right. Now, if we can, if I decide that, oh, now you want to get new and I don't want to cooperate <laughs> with the process, then, okay, I got to step away from you. Yeah. Yeah. Well, this has been great. This has really been great. And I'm so glad that uh, we had the opportunity to do this, to watch that, to watch that rebroadcast of that show and to talk about these different things that we still need to be talking about. I'm so glad that we were able to come back now. We're, we're going to be every Sunday at 6 p.m. Um, up until, um, I'm not sure about Christmas weekend and New Year's weekend. We're not sure about that yet. But anyway, every Sunday up until at least Christmas, we're going to be here looking at some of the shows that we've done. And in January, we'll restart our season two in January. But it was so great to have this conversation and the conversations that we definitely need to be having with one another, with our children, with our grandchildren, with our with our girlfriends. And it is so important that we continue to have this conversation so that we can address colorism and work towards eradicating it in communities of color all across the globe. So thank you, Rini. You're welcome. Thank you thank for having me. Lauren, thank you for being with us. Thank we you. thank anyone else that's on and, and anybody else that will um, see the replay, please invite others to watch 
colorism conversations and to begin to become a part of the conversation because we've got to be part of the solution. So you guys have an absolutely amazing rest of your Sunday evening and uh, we'll see you next week. Be blessed. 